Welcome everyone to the DMI Member Showcase. I am delighted to be joined by Rod Strother. Rod is a DMI member and he has recently undertaken the DMI Pro and successfully certified with us. He's the Managing Director at Integrated Brand with Edelman. Rod is an original Scotsman and has been living and working in Singapore for the last 14 years and has been living in Asia for over 23 years. Thanks for joining me today. No problem. Glad to be here. Uh, Rod, to kick things off, what I'd love to start off with is if you wouldn't mind telling me a little bit about you, your career and your background. Um, well, I've split half my career on the agency side and half on the client side. I actually started out working at British Gas in Scotland. So I was, a, I was an original gas man way, way back. Um, jumped over to the agency side. So I was poacher. I was gamekeeper turned poacher. Um, I had done the agency side for about three to four years and really wanted to work overseas. So my plan was New York. It's got to be it's got to be New York. And I had an opportunity to go work for Gray out in Malaysia. I had no idea where Malaysia was. Probably couldn't have found it. Probably couldn't have found it on a map. Um, and but I did know that Gray was a global agency with its headquarters out of New York. So I thought two years, go out, do that and then move on to New York. That was 1997, um, and I'm still in Asia. Uh, got off the plane, and as you said, yes, coming from Scotland, got off the plane, looked at the weather, and went, this is perfect. Um, <laughs> it was just <laughs> great, great being away from the rain and the cold, knowing that I could get up 24 hours a day and it was going to be hot, perfect. And, and never really looked back, but I've, I, I stayed in Malaysia for about eight years and was there to grow the Grey Direct brand. Um, and I was on the board of directors at Grey Global Group for about eight years. And they did try to move me. They did offer me two years in, they did offer me a job out in New York and then sort of negotiated to stay a bit longer. Then they came back in and tried to move me to San Francisco and then we stayed a bit longer. But after eight years, I, it was time to really, time for a change. And I went over to New Zealand uh, which was as far away, I suppose, as I could possibly get from Scotland, but probably as close to Scotland as you could possibly get. Um, especially <laughs> yes, when you have places. <laughs> it was back, back to Scottish weather and, and back to places like Dunedin with Highland Games and things like that. So did it for about 18 months. Uh, worked for a, an agency network over there for about 18 months and was then headhunted to come to Singapore uh, to work with BBDO and head up proximity, the data, digital and, and direct arm. Went over and I, I did that for about two and a half years and, and then there was the global financial crash. So I did, I did nothing for a little bit of time and then did some uh, content management for a year, which was really interesting. And then got an opportunity that I suppose changed my career a little bit um, or maybe, maybe more than a little bit, was to go to Lenovo. And that was to start up a, the Digital and Social Center of Excellence, which was an initiative uh, in conjunction with the Singapore Economic Development Board. And the idea being to bring global jobs and global thinking into Singapore. Uh, Singapore as a country, as a government, really had an initiative then to build digital marketing, to build the whole digital site. And has subsequently then gone on to do analytics has been key and then AI and blockchain and everything else. Singapore's always progressing. Mm -hmm. um, so my job was to come in and start up the center of excellence. So it was a global role, but based out here in Singapore. So I did that for about four and a half years, but it, it, it really afforded me so much opportunity to do things that, to be honest, I probably wouldn't have ever had a chance to do either on the agency side or to be honest in, the, in a lot of other companies because Lenovo, you know, like a lot of companies has its, you know, it's four P's and or four C's. Lenovo had four P's. And when I joined, they introduced a fifth P, which was pioneering. And I said that we used to get to be able to tick that box on 1st of January every single year, because my team was constantly pioneering, whether it was bringing in new tools and technologies and the social media side, or whether it was working with influencers, which was something that we'd never done at a global level before, crowdsourcing content. So all those sort of things that we, we had an opportunity to do 
uh, I was very, very fortunate to get that opportunity from the company. Then it became time to move again. And uh, I followed one of the people that hired me. I followed him over to, he became CMO at one of the big telcos here in Singapore. And I followed him over to run digital. So I ran all of uh, the social media side. I brought social media in-house. Uh, I parted company with the agency and, and built, built that all in-house. So everything from the analytics to content uh, to even advocacy, we developed all in-house. But I also had e-commerce, which was a big part of, of what we were driving, uh, was the online shop. Um, then the UI side, UX, uh, digital analytics, social listening. And we built a whole team up internally, became a lot less reliant on outside parties. And did that for about three and a half years. I also went on to run the brand and Marcoms side for the company as well. And then the company had a, a, a reshuffle. Um, and I, I worked there on a contract basis and I was very, very happy. But then people at the top started to change it as well. And it was, again, time to, to move on. So I took a bit of a break. And that was when I got involved with the DMI. Um, was took a bit of a break and thought I had some some time where I could uh, I could actually go back to school if you like. So it was <laughs> the first time that first time that I'd I'd gone and done any studying, proper studying, um, since probably 1996, I think when I did my uh, my IDM course, um, and uh, so I went back to do that. But then just as I was about to complete the course. Then a new job came up, which was the job over at, over at Edelman. Fortunately, I managed to complete the course before I actually st started again. Um, so devoting, you know, a couple of hours a day or whatever was was still sort of okay for me. Um, and and here I am back on the agency side. Yeah, that would have been a real baptism of fire if you had the course still ongoing while starting a new job. <laughs> Well, yeah, different. Different if I'd been in the job for a while and then and then yeah. picked up the course. I mean, I I feel for anybody who tries to do them both at the same time. That's that would have been a little bit. That would have been challenging. I've got to be honest with you on that. Much as I found the course, everything's made very simple on the course. Uh, you know, just the methodology, which was all new to me. It was a new way of of studying for me. I think trying to do both at the same time would have been uh, wouldn't have been the most sensible thing to do. <laughs> and tell me, uh, what was it about a career in digital marketing that appealed to you? I think I wandered into it, to be honest. Um, I was already, I, I always consider myself, I, I don't necessarily consider myself a digital guy. Somebody referred to me recently as a brand guy. And I said, I'm a marketer. And that one I would, you know, that one I wouldn't push away. I've been in marketing for 35 years. Mm -hmm. in one way or another, whether it's retail marketing or whether it's on the brand side or integrated as I am at the moment. Um, my my ex-CMO described it as marketers with a digital lens. And I, I thought that was a great way of looking at it. And I think that's, that's probably how I, I look at things now. But digital for me, I, I first touched digital probably in 2000. Uh, and we did a website for P&G. We had no idea really what we were doing, you know, because it was so new. Um, then I think the next, probably the next inflection point for me would have been going into Lenovo uh, because that was really hardcore social uh, because I ran social media marketing for the company globally. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we put in place all the strategy, tools and technologies, everything we built up. And from scratch, myself, the team in Singapore and the team that we had in North Carolina, you know, we worked very closely together to be able to do that for the organization. Uh, so that would have been the big inflection point after that was then dr dive down into into social media. But I feel that these things come in waves. You know, I was I was very involved in direct marketing. That's really where I started my my career. You know, in British Gas, I was the first direct marketing person that we had in the company in Scotland. And I wrote the first direct marketing plan. Uh, and then when I moved to the agency side, I was in you know specialist direct marketing agencies. Then of course you had digital come in, you know, sort of late 90s, 2000 or so that, that I first got into it. So that was the next big wave. Then you have social come in, you know, as, as the next big wave after that. And you've got CRM and 
the when I went to the telco side, my my title was the sexiest job title of the year, which was um, VP of Digital Transformation. None of us knew what it was, um, but everybody, you know, sexy, digital, it was it was very it was very sexy. <laughs> Um, the, the person didn't norm, didn't necessarily go along with the job title, but the the job title was <laughs> really sexy. Um, and and it was digital transformation. One of the first things that I I did was to define what digital transformation meant for us. So that was the next big wave after that. So I think, and I've always said, you you either you're either trying to ride the crest of that wave, or you're just going to get completely swept away. And I've always tried to be just keeping my head above water. Um, on those sort of as the crests of waves come in and just managed to, to keep myself self above water and I, I've usually managed to, to get away with it. And you've obviously whenever you spoke about your background there had a very varied um, career working on both the agency and the client side so you've really had the benefit of experiencing both sides of the table so I suppose Don't you what dare ask me which one I prefer. <laughs> no, wouldn't dare, wouldn't dare. <laughs> but I suppose, what learnings have you taken away from these experiences, and how do they, I suppose, impact you uh, or uh, throughout your career? I think I would, I would say to anybody who's on either side of the fence, go do the other at some point in your career, because I think then, it, and I started off on the, the client side. I think when I went to the agency side, and I remember when they hired me, they, they were hiring me specifically, was, was one of the key things they were hiring me for was because I had the agency side knowledge. And everybody that I think most of the people that I was working with had all been agency people. And I could sit with a client and I had a, an understanding of what they were going through, you know, what it was that they were having to deal with, where they were in a matrixed organization or whatever. I had a decent idea so I could talk the language um, and I you know now going back to the agency side after you know 11 years I still see that I still see that as something that, that's important because I you know even though I've only been there a couple of months I've sat in meetings and I've thought oh you know and I've, I've said to somebody maybe they're going through this though maybe that's why they didn't you know why they didn't buy the idea or you know why they're having to go through that and I think Sometimes you just have to have a little bit of understanding on what the client's having to deal with. Because as, as agency people, we go in and we give what we feel is a great idea. You know, we're all thoroughly behind the idea, but the client doesn't buy it. Or the client likes it at first. And a week later, they've completely changed their mind. And it's like, mm -hmm. oh, you know, they can't make their mind up or whatever. And actually it's not. It's because they've had to present it maybe two or three different layers and somebody towards the top doesn't like it. They don't like the color color blue. Um, logo's not big enough. You know, those sort of things that whatever reason, and that person is then going to come back to the agency and try and interpret what's come from their boss or their boss's boss. And they've got to come back and then explain why they're not going down that particular route with the, with the agency. So that's, you know, from that side of it. But there's the other side of it, where I've sat on the, the client side, and worked with people that have never been in an agency and then sometimes the demands that they make of the agency are, are completely unrealistic and, and just not fair and it's yeah. just because just because you pay the bill just because you're the paymaster at the end of the day doesn't mean to say that you're you're not working with somebody who's got a family and maybe wants to go home at night um or you know you just when you say to them i just don't like it well, how do you expect them to do something with that? How do you expect them to take that away and be able to brief the creative guys and say to them, well, what is it that they don't like? I don't know. You know, so I always, I would always, and I was fortunate that I, I did work with a lot of people who got that and who would articulate why they didn't particularly like something. And, and I've sat in meetings myself and turned around and apologized to the agency and said, I can't articulate why I don't like it, but I know it's wrong. I know it's not right. And I would work with the agency so they could help me articulate it better. But sometimes just that, that gut feel, you just say, and, you know, hopefully you build enough credibility with the agency because they know that you will tell them why you don't like something and you normally yeah. will articulate it. That Those times where you, you're just maybe not smart enough, you know, and you, you just can't. But you know inside that it's just the wrong idea that you're going in the wrong direction, that they will let you away with that. But 
I think it's important for people to spend time on both sides so that they understand what, what each other's going through. Because ultimately the best agency client, the best work comes out when you've got an agency and client who work well together and allow those, those positive tensions, you know, that pulling each other back and forward, you get those positive tensions in there as well. But, but ultimately you're both going for the same goal, which is, you know, whether it's to drive sales, drive leads, drive greater, greater brand engagement, or, or you're building the brand or whatever. As long as you're going in the same direction with the same end goal in mind and driven by that that same north star, then it's great. Uh, but I I would I would recommend anybody don't give up the job tomorrow. But at some point in your career, if you've got the opportunity, try the other side of the fence for a while. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, we spoke a little bit as well about in your career that you have really had the opportunity to be at the cutting edge of really pioneering mm. marketing strategies. So can you tell us a little bit about that and how do you bring something from concept to a, a reality? Um, I think, well, first of all, I mean, that was just when I was at Lenovo, it was, it was just a culture. Lenovo had what I would have described as a very ready fire aim um, approach and and one of the guys who was who was one of my mentors there um, and he was the guy that I followed over to the the telco site really really smart guy um, and he said something and I'm paraphrasing but I think we were number two in the world at that point when I joined we were number four in, in terms of PC companies, we were number four. Then next quarter, I think we became number three. Then the next quarter, we became number two. Absolutely nothing to do with me, but I just happened to be there at the time of, of these jumps. And I remember being at a lunch with him and with all my team as I was building the team out. And we had a lunch with him and he turned around and he, he said, just think, we're number two in the world and we don't get everything right. He said, we do a lot of things and we don't always get it right. Imagine where we could be if we were if we got everything right. And I remember him saying that as a PNG, he talked about the fact that PNG would research everything. And I knew, you know, I'd worked on PNG, research it, research it, research it until they get it right, and then do it, then launch it. He said that's not the Lenovo way. And Lenovo was ready, fire, aim, and then then get it right. And I thought that works for me because in what we were trying to do within my team. We're going to do things and we definitely aren't going to get them right. But as long as you learn from it, as long as you learn from it, you take it forward. So whether that was, was, you know, a new, was doing something different. When I joined, Lenovo was, uh, sorry, uh, social media was something that you did when you had $10 left. You know, when we, we started off, I would sit in on the global campaigns and it would be that kind of, we got $10 left. What can you do on Facebook? And by the time I left, social media was leading the campaigns so because everybody got it uh, mm -hmm. our global head the global head of of the brand side who's still there really really smart guy and the next agency guy um he would say what are we going to do in terms of influencers what are we going to do in terms of, of of working with these guys so i mean in terms of the the, the pioneering stuff i remember give you a good example maybe was I, I got tasked with how can we be a leader in, in and I think that was the question was how can we be a leader in engagement marketing and I said well I don't do it I don't I'm not responsible for engagement marketing I just look at the social media side but it bugged me was how could we be a leader in, in social media because I said if we can look at that part and I had a, a think about it and I, I bounced it off a couple of people and I said one of the things that we, we, we look at within social is how do we measure ourselves and I used to get more questions on the global calls than anybody else. So if we were doing a big campaign, the PR guys would come and they'd present and there'd be a couple of questions I'd present and I'd get, you know, 15, 20 questions on metrics, measurements, what, you know, how was it a success? And it was just because you could measure so many things. People wanted to, you know, what were the metrics? And it used to bug me was I wanted to, I wanted to be able to give an elevator pitch over how well we were doing and not have to answer 15, 20 questions. Mm. And then everybody would still be okay. So that's how we're doing in terms of engagement rates. That's how we're doing in terms of this, but how are we doing overall? Because when you're talking to the CMO, you really do have two minutes to be able to give him that update. 
And I, I went back to my boss and I said, if you think about it, if we're a leader doesn't follow benchmarks, the leader sets benchmarks. And I said, how about we go work with somebody like, like a forester or a gardener and we try and come up with a metric for how you measure social media and see if we can come up with an idea around that. And he bought into it. And at the time I was working with, uh, we were doing some work with a company called Social Bakers, if you know those guys. And Social Bakers had just bought, I think they'd just taken over a um, data analytics company, you know, with data scientists and everything out in Prague, which is where, where their headquarters is. And I bounced the idea off them along with my analyst in the social team. And I bounced the idea of wanting to develop, to develop something like a social health index. So I said, you have a brand health index, measures brands and everything. I said, why don't we develop something around a social index? Let us go away and think about it. And they came back and they, they built it out of, they did what they called a, a PARS index, P-A-R-S, participation, acquisition, retention and shareability. Now this is, this is back in the days when you got access, when they had open access to all this. And the rule was that it had to be something that, were, that was public data. So of course in, in social, we also look at how do we drive people through onto the website? But I'm not gonna share that with anybody and they're not gonna share it with me. But your participation rates across YouTube, IG, Facebook, etc., those are public, that's public data and, and social bakers had access to all of that across all the different brands so you could benchmark and then they boiled it down that you can argue about boiling it down to one number or a metric but we wanted to see now i had no idea how we were going to come out and i'd gone in and sold this to everybody all the way up to the cmo to the global cmo i'd sold it in as this is how we were going to do it but i didn't want to do it against just Acer, Asus, Samsung, HP or whatever. I wanted to do it against Coke and against, you know, I mean, I, I had a, a hairy, audacious goal and that was to do it against Coke and against Nike um, and Microsoft and, and, you know, all these great social brands, all these brands that, that were doing really good social. I wanted to go up against them. And again, I might be getting my backside kicked. And I, you know, I, I, I went out there on a limb but I said, if we're going to be genuine and authentic, which were two sort of two of our key watchwords in the social team was always be genuine and authentic as a brand on social. And uh, we're not unique in that. But go out, go out with that. Was I said, I also want to see how, how badly or how well we're doing. And I said, and I'll take it. I'll take it. If we're, you know, if we've got 25 brands in there, which is what we measured, we, we called it the top 25. And I said, if we're number 25, I'll take it and we'll get better. And we eventually, they, they did it. And I said to social bakers, don't, don't, you know, gloss over it. I said, give us it straight. Tell us where we are. And uh, I can't remember where we were the first time round. I think about seventh or eighth out of about 25 brands. But we got to be in number one. We got to be in the top brand out of all those brands. Now this was global, but we actually then gave this out to all the markets. So every single market in Lenovo had the ability to tap into this and they could yeah. look at the social health index in their market. So they finally had something that they could go and sit down with their boss who was saying, how well are you doing on social? Because some of the markets were really sophisticated. Many of them were, you know, they had their own social teams and some markets, the smaller markets maybe had someone who did social on Friday lunch times, you know, when they could dedicate a couple of hours because they just didn't have the resources and maybe didn't have the budget. And we had to cater for, for all different levels in there. Um, and we put that in place and that became a metric that my team, that became a KPI for us was how did we move up every year? Um, and that's what we reported back. Now, I mean, it, things changed because you got less access in terms of the, the metrics around the platforms. But for those couple of years, probably for about, I would say about three, four years, that, that was, you know, we looked to that and we would look to see, but it also helped us on our strategy because we would drill down and we would look if, say, if our strategy was around shareability, I'm making it up, but if it was around shareability on, on Instagram, uh, if it was around that, 
we would look at how well we were doing in terms of our marks, you know, in terms of our, our scale. And if we were doing really badly, but we were doing well on acquisition, but we weren't bothered about acquisition, then it was a case of, well, what's wrong in our execution? So if that's, you know, what is there something wrong in the strategy, something wrong in the execution? And we that would allow us to drill down and see what was going wrong. So it was great for the, the campaign team and the platform team to actually then be, you know, a, a barometer, if you like, of, of how well we were doing on a weekly basis. So it allowed us to then calibrate in terms of the execution and allowed all the markets to do that. So that for me was was innovation. I think that was really, and we won an award at um, the, uh, God, I should remember what it was, but it was the PR awards where the, the uh, AMEC, A-M-E-C, we won a bronze um, and we entered as a non-agency, but we entered as a, you know, we entered as a client and we mm -hmm. thought it was, you know, but to get that and to be recognized by someone like Amec um, at a global level was was a great reward. I'd love to have yeah. done better than a bronze, but but to be awarded for that, I think, was was real sort of, uh, it was a, a pat on the back for, for the guys of, of doing something. But what was interesting was Social Bakers took it out and then sold it as a product, which was the deal. That was that yeah. was the deal. And they went out and, and, you know, people like DBS Bank, who are huge, they're, they, you know, uh, over here, but they're regarded as the one of the top digital banks globally. Um, they used to measure their social media on that, so it was quite it was quite interesting turning up and speaking at conferences, and you would listen to people talking about what they did, and so, someone would say, "How do you measure your social media?" Oh, we use the, the social health index, and you're thinking, "Oh yeah, you know, I know, <laughs> <laughs> I know where that came from. I know where I know who came up with that." And and our analyst who worked on it, she she put so much work in. And, and to be fair, it was the partnership with Social Bakers. Um, we couldn't, there's no way that we would have come up with something like that without working closely with those guys. But Lenovo allowed us to do that. It allowed us to go in and try those things. And we, maybe we would have come 25th. Maybe we would have been bottom. Uh, and I think about six months after I left, and I, I said to you, I followed, followed one of the, 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 the key people for me um, from Lenovo. I followed him over and he, he, sent, me, he sent me an email in the office and Brandwatch had recognized Lenovo, I think, as the top, along with Nintendo, I think it was, amongst the, it was the top uh, tech brand in social globally. And he sent me an email with it, with the link, and he said, congrats to you and your guys in, in taking Lenovo there. Um, so it was kind of nice, just, uh, it was about six months after I left, and it was kind of nice to see that, you know, you'd been recognized for something like that. But we just got, we just got so many opportunities to do things like that, working with, with YouTubers and getting YouTubers to create content for us. It sounds passe now, um, but back then, working with guys like Ryan Higa, Niga, Niga Higa was, was him, and he was like the fourth, I think he was fourth or fifth biggest um, YouTube star globally. And we got introduced to him, the Google guys introduced us to him, and we came up with an idea to, to come up with some content for him. And I remember them, I remember being absolutely, um, what's the polite way to say it? Being nervous um, before he came back with his video. And we did a thing where we sent him a tablet and because he, he did a segment in his Higa TV. Now bear in mind, this is a guy with, with who had 2 billion video views at this point, not bad going. Yeah, and well. yeah, and, and Ryan had this segment on his show where people sent them gifts. So we sent them, we sent them a gift. I mean, it was okay, it was staged, but they hadn't really played around with it. And we sent them this gift and they were videoing it. And the guy said, Oh, we've got we've got this gift. It's coming from Livono. And the, when we got it, when we actually saw it, they sent us the segment and said, What do you guys think? And we said, You got the name wrong of the company. And they're like, Oh, do you want us to edit? And I went, No. And I shared it with the global, the global head of brand. And the, the SVP of brand, I shared it with him and he wet himself. He thought it was hilarious. And I said, I'm saying don't change it. And he went, absolutely not. Don't change it. Because it was genuine. It was a real mistake. They really made it a mistake. And, and then you heard one of them go, it's not Lavono, it's Lenovo, you clown. You know, and, and they went on and then they, they did their whole thing with un unboxing it. Because we used to do unboxing videos all the time. But we thought, how about them unbox it and do 
you know, do an unboxing video and play around with it and everyone else. We gave them complete free reign. And um, now that's part and parcel of every Instagram, YouTube. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we I mean we we didn't start it, but we, we were in early in the race was yeah. to do something like that. And you were you were kind of on a bit of a knife edge because you were never quite sure of what they were going to do. But it was I think it was the fact that I had really good people around me, not just my team, but I had really good people supporting me. My, I was very lucky to have really good bosses over there who would then manage, we would manage up the way, whether that was to CMO or all the way up to, to YY, to Yang Cheng, um, who was the, the chairman. And he was incredibly supportive. You know, even as the, the global chairman, he was, he was incredibly supportive of the sort of stuff that we were doing because he realized this is what we need to be doing. You know, we need to be playing in this area, especially with the target audience that we had, you know, the people that we were aiming at on the consumer side. Um, so, you know, he gave us a, a bit of free reign to do that. And I imagine that's quite an exciting and invigorating kind of experience to be working in, but also probably, as you said, very hairy as well. So I suppose, is that the environment that motivates you? Is that what you I, really- I don't know. <laughs> there was a, I, I think, I'm, I don't know if I'd, I'd mentioned it to you guys once before, but um, I wanted to get Yan Cheng, YY, I wanted to get him onto LinkedIn. And I'd been over at, I'd been over at LinkedIn's office over in the, the States, and we'd gone over to do a boot camp. And I thought, what if we could get YY on as one of the global influencers? Because I think they have a, was it top 400, top 500 global influencers? And let's be fair. Lenovo is the number one PC company in the world. He should be there, you know. And you know, in China, for example, the man is a is a superstar. He just, you know, you watch him. I've been at conferences, and I've I've seen, you know, when they've done things with 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 the public, and watched how people look up to this guy. You know, just fantastic. And I thought he should be on LinkedIn. Ten months it took me. It took me ten months of presentations all the way up the chain um to the vp of corporate comms who was a great guy and he got it and he said we need to find the right moment we need to find the right moment and you know we just kept pushing it in and eventually i got my spot we had all of the top leaders 240 of them i think in singapore for a digital training session well they, they were over for a conference but part they did one day i think of a digital training session and we had, you know, waited and waited and we, we wanted to get them. And I went off to the toilet. So they all filed out of the conference room. You know, I'd, I'd sort of waited, waited, and my team are all around. And I came back and everybody was gathered around this, this round table. So I was sort of at the back trying to look over and see what was going on. And, and as I got sort of to the front, I was face to face with YY and he just looked up at me. And I could hear this discussion about LinkedIn. And I thought, oh, God. And the guy, Jeff Schaefer, who was the, the VP of, of the corporate side, corporate comms, he was explaining why YY needed to be on LinkedIn. And YY looked over at me and everybody sort of looked at me and I had to do my 30 second spiel after 10 months, my 30 second spiel. And he just turned around and looked at Jeff and he went, make it happen. Thanks, gentlemen. Thanks, ladies. And got up and walked away. <laughs> and it was like, oh my God, the week after, he had to be on Twitter. Within a week, he had to be on Twitter. Now, the thing was, it's the I used to say, people say, do you do you go top down or bottom up? You know, in terms of build, 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 and then get to the top, or do you sell into the top and then come down? I said, you do both. You have to do both. So when YY says make it happen, he's expecting it to happen within a day, two days. Fortunately, we had everything in place everything, all the, the technical side of it, I had LinkedIn lined up and LinkedIn were, were great partners. I was very lucky there. And so when I went to LinkedIn and I said to them, why, why is ready? Press the button, it was ready. And we had the content ready, everything. And up he went. Um, and we were ready to, to get content out there and just very, very successful. The Twitter one kind of caught us was a bit left field, but that was okay. We, we, we managed to do that, but that was like the next week was get me on Twitter. Um, and just the light bulb, you know, 
very, very smart guy. But the light bulb went on. And when the light bulb comes on, everybody else has to come alive as well. So you, yeah. you do your prep. You do your prep was one of the things that I learned over there was was get everything ready to to go. I I think if you're afforded that and you have the team around you to be able to deliver that, then being in that sort of environment, um, you can you can manage that. But it's you um, you allow for those left field those curveballs coming in from left field. And were they some of the standout moments that you had in your career, or is there anything else that kind of sticks out as like, oh yeah, that was that felt good. That that was whatever. Today was a good day's work. <laughs> well, I would hope there's been other good days. Um, <laughs> I I think yeah. I mean, Gray going to Gray was um, and and getting off the plane in like I said, getting off the plane in Malaysia before the days of um, the new airport, uh, uh, KLIA, you know, that beautiful, that beautiful airport out in Malaysia. And that wasn't, that wasn't ready when I got there. We landed in a small airport. Um, that was a big moment. That was a big moment. And it was a big moment for me when I walked into the boardroom. Bear in mind, I, you know, just out of Edinburgh. Out of Edinburgh and was working for a, a really good agency over there. Um, and but it was 25 people and I suddenly walk into an agency um, and I go into the boardroom this huge boardroom great big long marble table and I'm looking around the wall at the brands around the wall and I'm going you know uh you know I can't remember that I mean some of the brands that that, that we had P&G you know Pantene what a brand like Pantene that you watch the ads on the telly, you know, back, back in those days. You've got Pantene, you've got Mars, um, you've got Pedigree. You're looking at these really massive FMCG brands, you know, that just all the sort of either bottles or packets all around the room and just global iconic brands that were there. And I sat there and, and got the creds presentation from the CEO uh, and really took a big gulp because I thought, this is big time. You know, I'm just a boy from Edinburgh, you know, boy from Edinburgh and, and come from a wee agency in Edinburgh and suddenly you land there. And that was when you realized the size of the task. And of so, course, they told me, they Gray, you know, in, in good showmanship had told me, don't worry, everything's, everything's there, everything's fine. I had an account exec who had zero experience in direct marketing, you know, and I, I had to build up the whole direct marketing side. And she was great. She went on to become business director. Uh, moved down from Malaysia down to Singapore and was was carried on being very successful because she was just really smart. Without her, I would have I would have died. Um, and we built it. You know, we went out, we built it. And I, I think the big big moments for me would be winning our first big pitch against uh, Ogilvy One. And the Ogilvy One guys just used to turn up. No disrespect, Ogilvy's a great agency, but they just used to turn up and hand their business card in, and people go, "Oh, it's Ogilvy One." You know, they'd already won before we walked in the door. Um, and we rock up as Grey Direct. And they go, who? And uh, we went in and we just, you know, we went and convinced them. And the first big pitch for us was Shell, was going in and winning Shell's loyalty program and was, was working on that. And the Ogilvy guys came out, and I still remember them walking out of the door and taking half an hour longer than they were supposed to. And us standing outside, getting more and more nervous outside. And, walking out and the MD, who was, a, who was a good guy and became a mate. And he walked out and sort of went, best of luck, mate. Just winked at me as he, as he went out of the, the room. And I'm like, we'll, we'll see, we'll see. And when we got that news through, you know, a couple of days later that we've appointed you and we're like us. Um, and that was the first big moment for, for us was doing that. And I think winning, you know, winning awards at the Capels to win and be recognized globally for a you know for an agency in in Malaysia um and the work being done by was you know it wasn't like we flew in a bunch of expats uh, this was it was a predominantly Malaysian team who were just very very good whether on the account management side or strat or creative they were just really good and we just built we built it up to I think it's it's biggest it wasn't huge it was about 40 people um but we I left when we won the work for the best campaign of the year for Tiger Beer, 
Um, and Tiger being, you know, Tiger's obviously a Singaporean brand, but it's iconic mm -hmm. out here. And we'd come up with an idea to do for their football marketing. We pitched, we went to the pitch, we won the pitch, and we came up with an idea called Tiger FC. And FC didn't stand for football club necessarily. It stand, stood for fearless comrades, comrades, fanatical citizens, because it was, a, it was about, they sponsored the TV broadcast of football because you couldn't do, in Malaysia, you can't do uh, alcohol advertising. It's, uh, it's not allowed and um, certainly not on TV. And, uh, but this was about those, they broadcast, they sponsored the, the, the broadcast of uh, the EPL. And uh, so it was about drinking moments. And we did this whole relationship program around it. And it was massively successful. So Tiger in Malaysia is associated with Diageo. And Diageo took it in as one of their, their best practices. And it was shared around the world. So to have that recognition from Diageo, but then to win an award for, I think it won for best campaign of the year. Um, that was a high note for me because it was recognition of the great work that the, the guys had done. And, and we'd spent, you know, a couple of years building up uh, would probably have been another another high note for me. Perfect. And at the start of the piece, I introduced you by saying that you've been living and working in Singapore for the last 14 years. So I suppose it would be great to kind of get an uh, understanding and your perspective on what the landscape for digital marketers is like in Singapore. One of the things that when I look at Singapore, what's interesting is, and I've experienced it myself because I've done it, is so many clients bringing things in house. So a lot of things that you would have seen on the agency side previously or on the, you know, the partner side, if you like, are now done by, by clients in house. Um, one of my ex guys who was over with me at Lenovo and then followed me over to Starhub. Her expertise is in social listening. She's now gone to work at Netflix, which sounds like a sounds like a good number, but she's over at Netflix. So she's doing all the social listening internally. They're not outsourcing that. Um, when I was at the, the telco side, when I was over at the telco, um, we used to outsource so much, you know, especially on the, the website, we would outsource you know, people doing the, the, the UX for us, the UI, and, you know, the coding was even done externally. And as I was, was you know, building up the team, some of the guys that I brought on board, you know, I, I sat down with them and said, so, so what do we want to do? You know, do we, we can either continue to, to, you know, spend a lot of uh, OPEX with it going out and making some of the agencies and, and digital companies quite rich I said or we start to bring people in house who have the skills I said the question is going to be how do we find those people and that was that was tough in certain areas finding coders and good coders because we wanted to bring that in house so that we could be more nimble that was quite challenging UX was incredibly challenging uh, and I, I had a UX guy really I managed to find a really good UX guy he was with me for a year and he got headhunted by by DBS Bank and it was like, you know, I couldn't argue with it. You know, I, I had people in with me that were, I had a guy, a really good guy who was on the social listening team, uh, so, social analytics. Google come in headhunting. And, and he came to me and he said, I can't turn it down. He was a young guy. He wanted to build his, his profile. He said, I can't turn it down. And I couldn't argue with it. So that scarcity of talent is still there. And you've got to take into account that, that Singapore also has a, a regional role. You have an awful lot of, whether it's on the agency side or the client side, whatever, there's a lot of regional businesses based here. So therefore you get a, you know, you do get your centers of excellence also based out of here. Um, and they're not just, then you've not just got them servicing Singapore, but they're actually working across a lot of the different markets. So you'll get, a, you'll get, you'll get talent here but it also becomes quite tough trying to find really good talent as well. And ideally you want to find, in all honesty, you want to find local talent because, you know, the, at the end of the day as expats, that's what we're supposed to be there for is, yeah. is really bringing in expertise that maybe doesn't exist, but making sure that we build a strong Singapore and we build a strong, you know, local community and, and local talent, and, which is something that, you know, I'm, I'm really keen on doing within Edelman. 
um, is then developing the guys that are that are in there because they're the future of the agency. You know, much as I like to kid myself on, um, you know, at the end the end of of where I am in in my career and, and at my age that they're the future. They, I'm not the future, and I keep telling them that. So it's whatever I can I can pass on and and develop them. But what's great for me is seeing really good local talent coming up. But the scarcity, there's still a scarcity in the market. And that's just talking about digital talent. That's not even going down to that niche level of do you have, you know, do you have people that understand AI and, and things like that? Yeah, we do. But again, you know, finding data scientists is is still tough, you know. So the the jobs are there and the we have really good talent. We just don't have enough of it. That's the that's the challenge in the marketplace. And uh, you mentioned there about uh, you saying to your staff that um, they're they're the future. So it's probably a good um, introduction into I suppose finding out a little bit about what your leadership style is within uh, within your within the Edelman within just your career. Um. Well, there's my answer to it. It's not necessarily what my my staff's answer to it or the guys that I've worked with. And I'm, you know, hopefully it comes across. But I'm I'm relatively straightforward. Uh, maybe it's the Scottish it's the Scottish gene, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. But what you see is what you get. And I, because I, I'm a big believer in in transparency. Um, and I've had a had a team meeting with my guys this morning, and I was I was filling them in on a couple of things. And I actually said to them, I'm really sorry, do you normally get told this sort of stuff? I said, because maybe you don't. I said, but you'll find that I will tell you. And it wasn't telling them anything bad, but it was just telling them a couple of things that were going on in the agency. And I wasn't sure if that would normally get shared uh, because in some organizations you don't share that. My view is, unless I'm told, if, if I know something's confidential and I'm, I'm smart enough to know when I shouldn't be telling something, then the rest of it, the guy should know because when it's your senior leaders, they need to know what's going on in order for them to be able to manage their teams. And I've said to, to them, if you come to me and you, you want to ask something, you want to talk about something, I said, you're always going to get an honest answer. I said, and I'll tell you when I can't tell you something. Um, I believe a lot in empowerment um, because I think that, I, I, I mean, I, I stick to the old maxim of always hire people smarter than yourself. And I've, I've made a pretty good career out of, of hiring people smarter than me. Um, it's a low bar maybe to begin with, but then if you don't hire, if you hire people who are smarter than you and you don't empower them, then you're wasting them. You're wasting their time and you're wasting an opportunity. And a big driver for me and a big motivator for me is in creating high performing teams. I've always believed in creating successful teams because if I get to spend five minutes with somebody or five years with somebody, then I've got an opportunity to help develop them and, and help them along the way in their career in a positive in a positive way. And that's maybe helping them in terms of their, their uh, management skills, in terms of their, their client management skills or their leadership skills. But it could be helping them on the, the, the hard skills side as well, you know, whether that's helping them in digital or brand or, or whatever, just in marketing. So, and I, I, I get a, a huge kick out of seeing the guys that have gone on, you know, one of the guys that, that used to work with me up in Malaysia, he owns, I don't know how many agencies he owns now. And I worked with him when he was 25 and wouldn't turn up to work before 10.30 in the mornings. And, you know, he'd come in and I'd be, you know, I just need you to turn up on time. And he was, but the problem was he was one of those early, he was one of those early pioneers in digital. He had so much knowledge. He was also a great guy. Um, and, and I remember him, I worked with him, he was with me for maybe a year, two years, it was great. But every day it would be, is he going to turn up? And I remember when he went and he set up his own, um, he set up his own agency. And I remember bumping into him. I was back up in Malaysia and I bumped into him and he said, and he says, I wish I, I, he says, I wish I'd listened to you more. I says, why? He says, I've had a guy in the office, he never turns up on time. And he says, I've had to have a chat with him. He said, now I realize how you felt all the times that you had to pull me aside to do it. <laughs> so, but, but the satisfaction I've got in seeing him um, go on and, and, you know, and he's not the only one. I, I, I pick him out because just 
he, he sticks out in my mind so vividly. But there's been other people that I've seen go on to be either really senior on the client side or, or really senior on the agency side. Um, and if I got to spend five minutes with them or, or five years with them, as I said, that thought that you managed to, to help somebody along the way and, and at least hope that you've helped them along the way is, is hugely satisfying um, because that's all you've got to pass on. I remember a guy that I, I used to work with. Um, he was a partner with us. He was our first. He helped us on the database side with, with a big client of ours. He was an English expat. And I remember something he said to me was, you should never be selfish with information. You should never, never hoard information. He said, never hoard knowledge. He says, you should be like a river. And he said, you, you just pass these through all the time. So you gain it. And it's your responsibility to gain more, but pass on that knowledge. And that was the way he worked. Um, he was a great partner, but a really good guy as well. And I thought that was important, was always trying to pass those things on. Um, so I think, you know, my, my leadership style is, is always looking at the next generation. Is looking at the people that are going to take that are going to take my job. Um, you know, I need to find. You need to reinvent yourself, or you need to to find something new to do. And and I look at the guys that are, that I'm working with now, and you know, one of them or whatever is will take my job. And it's just finding out which one is the the best one is going to be the best one to take my job, and who wants to do it. But yeah. it's also then preparing the rest for what's the rest of their career going to look like as well. So. You know that that kind of very. I have a very simple view to very simple view to management and uh, that sort of thing. I I was asked when I joined in my interview. Um, they said, "What's your secret to management?" I said, "I I don't know that I have a secret to management." I said, "I have two things." I said, "One is um, the the realization that I'm never the smartest person in the room." I said, and that allows me to ask the most stupid questions. I said, and sometimes when you ask the most stupid questions, the smart people in the room didn't want to ask it because they're too smart to be able to ask it. I said, I'm not. So I said, so I can ask it. I said, and it tends to be the point where everybody goes, yeah, that's actually a really good question. But it's a dumb enough question that they may not have thought of it. Um, so I always have that realization. And the other one was always have a couch. Always have a couch in your room. And the reason for that is because on the agency side, People used to come and hang out and they would come and lie on the couch and sit on the couch and you found out so much of what was going on and they bounced things off you or you got to bounce things off them. Um, so you always made sure that you had a couch in the room just so they could come and hang out and, and, and find out things. There was a great way to just build up relationships and communicate with people and, and just find out what the hell was going on around you. It strikes me that communication is actually quite a strong theme coming in because even earlier on whenever we were talking about you know do you communicate from the bottom up or the top down do you know that that's um clarity do you know keeps everybody on the same page as well um if, if if they're hearing it from you then there's there's no um interpretation going on oh well, yeah i mean again people smarter than me that i've learned you know learned really good lessons off that i, I worked alongside and and at lenovo said it's always best to over communicate you know when they were we were running out global campaigns if we were launching a new a new product and they said we will over communicate and they said because the risk of under communicating they said put so many things in a rollout it puts so many things in jeopardy and they said so we will never apologize for over communicating and i thought that was a nice kind of maxim to, to live by um and they, they apologized for it in advance. Um, they apologized for the fact that they were going to do it, but they said, we will do it. Um, and I, I, I try and hold by that as well, is to, to let people know what's, what's going on. It's up to them how they're going to take that information and what they, what they do with the information. They hope they, that they use it in the right way. But that goes along with the transparency. Um, I was going to ask you, but you kind of have covered it a little bit. Um, if you'd got any valuable advice that kind of has stood by you through your, your career, I suppose you, uh, you've you given a set about, you know, let knowledge be a river then. <laughs> um, oh, let, but, um... let knowledge be a river. That's better. I'll take that. That's better than what I said. I think, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think you ordered it perfectly. <laughs> um, and I suppose. Um, 
with your, t- you've obviously done the DMI Pro recently, we discussed mm. that both as a leader within your team, did you find that beneficial in connecting to your team or how do you stay connected to them? So I think one of the, the key reasons for me actually taking up the course was wanting to be able to connect um, and connect with you know whatever my next job was going to be at the time, was to connect with the people that I worked with. And I put a note out on LinkedIn um, and it was interestingly enough, it was one of the guys from Edelman that actually responded back to me, an Irish guy. So I don't know if there was a theme. Um, and he said to me, do the course. He said, you should take this. He said, I did it. He said, really good. And so I, I had a bit of a look. What was great for me was that one of your guys called me up. So I sent, a, you know, I, re, I sort of sent in a question and I got a phone call. He phoned me up and he said, do you have any experience in digital? And so I went, well, a bit, you know, I said a, a little bit over the, and I thought, how, I wasn't sure how to answer it without sounding a bit, you know, sounding arrogant or sounding, you know, being a smart aleck or what. And I said, I, I told him and he said, why are you doing this one then? And I said, <laughs> well, hold on. I said, I'm doing this for a specific reason. I said, because the stuff that I, the, the, the topics that I can pick up here I said, when you're a leader, I said, when you're a leader of teams, you don't always get your hands dirty. Um, and I like to get involved with the guys, but I found sometimes I would sit in conversations and I'd be nodding and thinking, I don't know what they mean. Um, you know, when they got very, you know, very deep into certain areas. And I thought, I'm letting you down. I'm letting you down because I can't give you good input. Um, I mean, there's, you know, you get me on certain topics and I can give you input till the cows come home. Um, might not always be helpful, but I can give you input because I, I know what I'm talking about. But but then I was having conversations on, say, about SEO. And it was like with the person responsible for SEO who knew her subject inside out. I'll never know as much as, as she would unless I went off and really, really spent time. But I wanted to know enough about it. And there was a number of topics on there. You know, the whole social media section was was like, you know, I ran social media, but that didn't mean to say that I knew everything in, in, in detail in certain areas. Um, there were certain areas on there that just, boom, straightforward for me. You know, and I'm sure there would be for everybody else who, who decides to, to pick it up, who spent any time in digital. Um, and there were just areas that just was like, yeah, yeah, got it, got it. And then there was other areas where I'm going back and watching it again and watching it again and going, okay, and then taking the quiz and then going back and watching it again. Um, But that's what it was there for, for me, was to, so that I felt confident enough as a leader um, that I, you know, I've done, I've done five, I think five diplomas. Um, I was never smart enough to go to uni and went out and got a job, went out and got a job pretty quickly. but I did communications. I did my first diploma in communications. I did a diploma in marketing, a diploma in direct marketing. I did the CAM diploma, the communications advertising marketing diploma, which kind of rounded everything else up and then stopped studying. You know, I had done it. I'd done the the sort of full suite and worked in digital for 20 years and didn't have, didn't have, and it was maybe an ego thing, maybe something just, I felt you needed to have an accreditation. And, uh, looked at that and thought this just it just ticked all the boxes for me and I also thought I'm not sure I could dedicate the time I'm not a great student and I thought I'm not sure I can dedicate the time to going on and doing the masters or something like that and I saw the way I saw the the rundown of the course the format and it was very new to me I'd never done formal studying like this and it just appealed to me the way that I could could get into it but it was you know, it was for selfish reasons that I went in to do it. One, I wanted to get the accreditation and I wanted to prove to myself that actually you do know something. You haven't just spent 20 years in it doing a high level management job. You actually have knowledge. And so it was a validation. It was for me, it was validation. And then secondly was so that I could actually give some value back to the people that I was going to work with in my next job that I could sit and have a decent conversation with them and actually understand and, and still learn. And still learn that that the river, your your river of information, that's flowing from them to me. 
you know that's <laughs> there's also a bit of that and i mean that was the big thing for me very quickly was the big thing for me at lenovo i you know when i i went in to do the the digital and social center of excellence i got cold feet just before i took the job and i went out and spoke to not the recruitment consultant who i was dealing with i went out and spoke to another recruitment consultant who i knew really well and he said to me in the land of the blind the one-eyed man is king and he said you'll know you'll know enough in there he says and you're smart enough to be able to pick it up really quickly but he said the the benefits to you are going to be huge in terms of how it changes your cv how it changes based on what you've done it takes you in a, a different direction and it builds from a career point of view it really builds but i hired people that really knew their area and they were still learning and they were learning stuff from me that was you know stuff i picked up you know um whether it was just marketing stuff direct marketing whatever you know working with agencies all that sort of stuff that i could put on the table for them but these were guys that were coming on board that 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 knew all about facebook you know just the ins and outs and and, and understand youtube and and you know what worked what didn't work and i was picking up loads from them so doing the pro doing the dmi pro was it just brought a lot of that stuff together in a in a formal way if you like it brought a lot of that those learnings um together for me so it was it was hugely helpful and um i suppose if we look now you've obviously have quite an expansive career path that we spoke about earlier about being a both sides that way of seeing them all the, not at all wouldn't dare <laughs> <laughs> but i what i what i am getting at is now with all that breadth of knowledge and experience that you have, if you could speak to yourself again at the start of your career, what advice would you give yourself starting out on your career? Um, put all your money on black. Don't put it on red. <laughs> <laughs> bet, it bet, on, bet on Liverpool to come back from 3-0 down at half time, I think. Yeah. No, I mean, I think I... I I'm not someone that has regret. I don't, it's not my personality um, to regret things in life. And I've made, like a lot of people, I've made major decisions um, career-wise and, and in my personal life. I've made major decisions and, and changed things, done things. And I don't look back and regret anything. There's probably only one thing that I would like to have, that I would like to have tried and I didn't, for for reasons at the time but was that the guy who was my ceo and who was my mentor um when i went to gray um and passed away a couple of years ago and i was really sad about that because he just he was a real father figure and i was you know early 30s when i got to, to gray and completely wet behind the ears you know in malaysia was you know in big agency and he took me under his wing and he was amazing just an amazing an amazing guy and he'd been out there God, 20 odd 30 years or something and he was a classic advertising guy i mean i can say this now because because he isn't with us any longer but he would be in the office at 6 30 in the morning and then the beer would be out at four o'clock in the afternoon you know and the cigarettes and everything else but it just the guy had just straight out of mad men i mean just straight out of of mad men just an, an an amazing an amazing sort of guy and he left the agency and I was still there. And he he approached me and said, and we were tremendous friends. And I just he knew I I looked up to him up to him, you know, massively. And he said to me, How about we set up our own agency? You you come in and you do the craft, you run it, I'll sort out all the financials and do all that stuff, all that side of it. He says, But you do what you do. And it's the, probably the only thing from a career point of view and a life point of view that I look back at and I wish that would have been interesting. And I don't regret, I don't regret it. I don't regret not doing it, but it would be something that I wish I'd seen how that would have worked because I trusted him implicitly. Uh, and he would have been a great partner and he would have been, I would have learned, I would have continued to learn from him. But he was the person who let me, like I had in Lenovo, in Gray, he let me go build Gray Direct from scratch. He let me go build it and, and, and corrected me when I was wrong and, and taught me things about life, taught me things about how to be a better person. 
um, how to be a better manager, how to be better at my job, but how to be a better person. Um, I learned so much from the guy that I'm thinking, imagine if I'd gone and done that within the agency and would have continued to learn from him. Um, it's one of the things I wish I'd seen how it turned out, but then maybe I wouldn't have from there, maybe I wouldn't have then gone off to New Zealand and maybe I wouldn't have come from New Zealand to Singapore and, and Singapore's home. Singapore is home for me. It would be very, very difficult to get me out of Singapore. Um, and Singapore, you know, the plan is the plan is retire in Singapore. Um, you know, it's uh, so maybe those things wouldn't have happened. That that's why I, I'm not a big believer in in having regrets, um, and why you have to make those those big decisions. I could have gone to New York. I could have gone to New York, but I had a feeling that I like Asia. I really like Asia. And then when they offered San Francisco, it was like, oh, you know, big global role in San Francisco, but I like Asia. I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying Asia. And, and I didn't go. And that was always my plan. That was always my plan was to go and, and work out of the US. I just thought the US was, was where it was at. And I, I still think, you know, that would have been yeah. interesting. But I don't regret not doing it. And uh, as we come to wrap up the interview, and thank you very much for uh, uh, joining me. I've really enjoyed it. Um, but I always ask everybody one last question, which is, a bit left field it's not an ad talk but uh it's this is all about getting to know you so as we wrap up can you tell me an interesting fact about yourself that we haven't covered and that we wouldn't know of your professional biography uh oh my god okay i used to write a sex advice column um really? for, yeah um I was approached, and this is this is um this was after I left uh, BBDO. After I left BBDO, um, someone was writing for one of the biggest female magazines. She was the the sub editor, uh, my sister in law, and she was the sub I think the sub editor at the biggest or one of the biggest female magazines in Malaysia, and she asked me if I would write a guest column just for that month would I write a column called His Dating Life? Um, so it was a female magazine, but they wanted to hear from a guy about dating. And uh, so I wrote that month. And the editor came back and said, that, we love it. And I said, what the hell do you want to get a 40-year-old expat guy? You know, what, what the, you know, what have I got to say? And so they made it a regular column. And they would write to me, and ask me, so this month, can you write about how can how can you save money in your relationship? And I'm thinking, oh, so it's money tips. Oh no, we're thinking like taking showers together and think, and I'm thinking, oh, okay, okay, see where this is going. So every month it would be questions about what are men like and 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 tips for the ladies and and this sort of thing. I mean, I got a red face. You know, I got embarrassed when they would send me through what I was supposed to write about. And I always tried to, I always tried to make it funny. Um, <laughs> I didn't want it to be too serious, but it, it was that. And I did it for, I probably did it for a couple of years. It didn't pay, it didn't pay much, but I, I did it for a while. And, and the thing was, they ended it, they revamped that particular magazine. I think it was, I wrote for female. I think it was female magazine. And as soon as I stopped writing for that, I was like, oh, okay, we're done with that. They've revamped it. They got rid of the column. Then the guys at their sister magazine, Her World, which was for ladies over 30 or over 35, they said, oh, can you write it for us instead? So I then had to go on and I wrote for them. Um, now, it wasn't online, so best of luck trying to find it. Um, <laughs> I was just thinking can... it would be a very different feature now with that. Uh... Uh... You know, uh, all the all the different dating apps and the um and and COVID nineteen thrown in for good measure. <laughs> there was yeah, there was no swiping. There was no swipe left and swipe right, or whatever you do. I've never had the app, so there was no swiping. But yeah, uh, well, that's what I, that's that's what I did. Well, I tell you what, I, I'd say it will be a while before somebody tops that one. <laughs> <laughs> good luck. <laughs> Listen, Rob, thank you very much for joining no me today. 
I really appreciate it and I love talking with you. It was great hearing about your, your background, your career and, and all the advice and stories that you had. So thanks very much. Pleasure. Thanks again.